Hyperacusis is defined as intolerance uh, to everyday sounds in a way that it impacts the person's day-to-day -day life and it causes significant distress in their activities. So in the other words, if someone is sensitive to certain sounds but it doesn't create significant distress in their life and it doesn't interrupt their day-to-day -day activities, it does not classify as hyperacusis. And that the sounds may be perceived as uncomfortably loud, unpleasant, or frightening or painful. There are many people who say they're actually hearing these noises, it's actually hurting their ears. <coughs> There are different def definitions for hyperacusis, and this is that I use in uh, my studies. So hyperacusis is a condition that if you are an audiologist, many people may uh, be referred to with this. And um, however, this fields other than audiology also have researched this topic or variations of it and uh, which I'm going to talk about them and uh, one of those uh, concepts is uh, noise sensitivity which is very much has been discussed in the literature re relevant to public health and environmental health and also another one in, more recently in the field of psychiatry is misophonia. I'm not going to talk about misophonia right now because we have a symposium of misophonia after lunch. So we leave the misophonia for uh, the afternoon session. So I was very interested in, in doing some literature search to find out how people conceptualize this sensitivity to sound. And uh, <clears throat> I was trying to, the, in the library, search and search. So who are these people who first uh, highlighted this sensitivity to noise? And what was the context in which uh, these studies started um, to be um, conducted? And I got to this. In the 70s, uh, during the 1970s, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, in the United States, carried out research studies on the impact of sonic booms and the general noise pollution created by aircraft on communities living near the airfields. So it was very interesting for me to actually find these documents and I'm going to share some of them with you today. And uh, they are not classified information. So, <laughs> or if they were, no longer are. Very old documents. <clears throat> this is one of example of those documents by Richard Pearson uh, and their colleagues. And this is what says on the document that they give it to, portions of the documents are not fully legible due to historical nature of the material. Some of the parts you can't really even read. <clears throat> and this is the time that Nixon was the president of the United States. And our queen was young and pretty. <laughs> so, one of these documents, I uh, like to bring some of the things that the thoughts that they had at the time. In agreement with British work, it is of interest to note that those who feel that aircraft noise can be prevented and generally higher, had generally higher annoyance rating. So the people who thought these noises could be prevented, they had more annoyance rating than those who didn't. So it's a thought process, very consistent with the things that we 
been discussing in the in the past. And this is a, a summary of this study that they conducted. So 166 male and female adult subjects varying in age, occupation, educational level, race, area of residence were exposed uh, and rated annoyance of six types of aviation and industrial noise stimuli in <coughs> simulated living room environment. This, follow, this followed assessment of personality and attitudes towards tra transportation, their community and noise. Mean annoyance rating to the noise stimuli varied considerably, despite the fact that the stimuli level, uh, levels in the test room were equated at the same peak sound pressure level, 82 dB. A considerable significant range of variation in annoyance rating was noted across subjects. Factor analysis of the personality attitude data resulted in identification of several useful factors for multiple regression prediction of annoyance, like noise sensitivity, anti-aviation, noise and health, interference with routine activities, phobic, imperturbable, and complainer. Since equations for multiple regression prediction of annoyance varied among noise stimuli, different factors may be responsible for individual annoyance response depending upon the type of the noise involved. Finally, the results suggest that generalized sensitivity to noise is a major determinant of the annoyance response, and they argue against the simple definition of annoyance in terms of disturbance of activity. Here they say, this study demonstrated the ability to assess individual sensitivity to noise. With, the dem with that demonstration, a new point of view, a model of noise annoyance was presented that may be useful in understanding why individual is more sensitive than another. The next step would be to see whether the internal inputs, as outlined by the model, can be manipulated to yield a change in the individual noise sensitivity. So when they were doing these studies, making sure how people cope with the sonic booms and airfield expansions and all this, so they got to this group of people which were much more annoyed by the noises than others. And this is a study, and, and you can see this is the ideas are generating how to actually change this sensitivity to noise that people have. Such research should be conducted concurrent uh, with engineering efforts to reduce noise problems uh, at the most desirable points of their source. They're also thinking, okay, how to reduce the sensitivity to noise that these people have and then also how to reduce the noise. Here are some thoughts from their research. Why do two people exposed to the same noise stimuli react differently? For a given noise, generally perceived as nauseous, an aircraft flyover lure over one's home, some individuals indicate little annoyance while others complain to their neighbors of the disturbance without taking action. A few may be severely annoyed to the point of, point of complaining to the authorities or of organizing protest groups. In reflecting upon their own research in this area, uh, Brodsky concludes that the determinants of human sensitivity to noise are extremely complex including such diverse variables as educational level, interest in aviation, kinds of activities disrupted by noise, attitudes toward noise sources, and personality. These individual differences in the annoyance response to noise deserve more attention. They form the basis for research described uh, herein, which has its goal, the development of the test for assessment of human sensitivity to noise. 
the use of a test to identify people along a, a dimension of sensitivity insensitivity would permit new approaches to noise research and uh, the work performance and physical well-being of sensitive and non-sensitive individuals would be contrasted. Efforts to modify the attitudes of noise-sensitive persons could be evaluated. Applications to personal selection in industry, government and military are apparent, as well as uses in urban planning and design. Very interesting things that they were thinking about almost 50 years ago. So, to summarize, they suggested that personality factors and attitudes towards noise source are the main determinants of human sensitivity to noise. From these pioneering studies, which were published in uh, NASA technical reports, as well as the work conducted by other groups at the time. It wasn't only these groups that done research on this, like UK's National Physical Laboratory and others. Uh, the concepts of noise sensitivity has emerged. And uh, there are questionnaires now to assess noise sensitivity for people. And this is one of the study that uh, Viziano and their colleagues uh, it's a very recent study in 2017. They, they assessed uh, noise sensitivity and hyperacusis in, uh, in patients affected by multiple chemical sensitivity. And uh, the, the focus of mine was the, these two together being assessed on a group of patients. And here they talk about, so this is the, they used Mainstays, no noise sensitivity questionnaire, WNS, and Halfa's hyperacusis questionnaire, HQ. And, and as you can see here, correlation analysis showed a strong positive correlation between WNS and HQ. So two highly correlated. Could be the same thing. So the way that hyperacusis is conceptualized in clinical settings um, more toward treatment and support for those people is uh, a bit different. And uh, the studies that uh, were done, people who pioneered the, these concepts in the way that we understand them today are Paul Jastabov and Margaret Jastabov who, uh, who talk uh, about tinnitus retraining therapy and sound intolerance and hyperacusis emerge from uh, their studies in collaboration with Jonathan Hazel and Jackie Sheldrick, who we are very lucky to have her today. And, um, so, and also Richard Tyler, who has done work on this. In fact, he was the first person who, who talked about the, the correlation between um, tinnitus and hyperacusis. <coughs> 